Thank you for attending today's webinar. Um, it will be dedicated to uh, the maximization of uh, the performance of an NVMe drive within your existing infrastructure. And um, the use case for today's webinar will be an ESXi environment, uh, the configuration of a VM, um, the benchmarking process, and the results which uh, we have uh, reached with uh, the implementation of NVMe within our environment. Now, since the most important part of any server infrastructure is the performance of the underlying storage, and we made a decision to look deeper into the responsible variables, which we will review during today's webinar. And uh, the direct dependency on the performance of the mission critical applications makes the matter even more important and can even cost an arm uh, and or a limb. You know. With all the available options for selecting the highest performing storage for your host taken into account, we also took into consideration uh, all the possible finger pointing ones. A storage area may not perform as it was planned. Yeah, so um, in a pursuit of blowing the dust off another long planned virtualization process consisting of improving the current storage performance of our existing infrastructure, we made a decision to take the first step uh, with the implementation of a device from the NVMe lineup. This is actually what it all started from. Yeah, so um, the victim of our wear and tear today would be Intel. Uh, after they released uh, its long-awaited NVMe line, um, uh, the nervous system actually had no time to recover from actually seeing all the possible benefits and the details of uh, each product. Now, um, once they became available on the market, their price didn't actually meet our expectations, and surprisingly in a good way. Now, the DC family spans from 400 gigabytes to a massive two terabyte capacity models, and uh, followed by fear of their specified performance. Now, the DC3700 series was chosen for the purpose of today's webinar. And as you can see, it provides the highest durability and write performance with up to uh, 465,000 to uh, 180,000 of a random read-write IOPS. Now, the sequential performance is just as great. Well, it's uh, 2,800 uh, and uh, 1,900 megabits a second as read-writes. Now, additionally, uh, the DC 3700 features uh, heat endurance technology with NAND flash memory, silicon enhancements, and storage management technologies to help extend its endurance, which is never a bad thing. And along with that, I think just like any other um, solid state drive, it also includes temperature monitoring and logging, which uses an internal temperature sensor to monitor the log airflow along with the internal temperature of the device. and the logged results can be accessed uh, by using a smart command. Now, the main characteristics of the DC3700 MOC is its low price, but on the other hand, it suffers from higher wear rates and lower write performance if compared to, uh, with a uh, SOC technology type of storage. Now, with the promised warranty limitations and uh, 10 disk write per day, and up to 36.5 written petabytes of endurance for the two terabyte model in particular, its uh, return of investment is not something to worry about other than the, the configuration of uh, maximizing its performance. Now, all models feature protection from host power failure and all P-series SSDs feature a five year warranty period with a uh, mean time between failures of two million hours. Now, out of all the possible limitations, just want to specify lack of uh, configuring a stable RAID out of uh, the NVMe drives. Now, in an attempt of completely utilizing the performance of the NVMe for today's benchmarks, we uh, just grabbed a single drive, uh, one of the many within our arm's reach, and inserted the 800 gigabyte version of the uh, P3700 into our ESXi host. Once again, feel free to ask any questions in the process of today's demonstration. I'll, I'll gladly make an attempt to answer them for you. Now, the following uh, VM configuration was used to meet uh, the maximum performance requirements and create a placeholder for a workload-intensive application. 
Uh, the configuration included a uh, CPU with eight sockets uh, with a single core each, a hardware CPU, MMU, a virtualization, and um, no reservation limit shared supplied. And uh, the RAM, uh, we specified as eight gigabytes with no reservations, limits, or shares. And uh, the scope of the benchmarks fell within testing uh, the next uh, SCSI controllers. Uh, they, the benchmark included a um, pair of virtual SCSI, an LSI, and uh, an NVMe controller. Now, uh, the main differentiating points in between them all would be that the pair of virtual would uh, merge um, all IOs and not the throughput, which means that the virtual machines that are requesting a fair amount of IOs um, that the storage would not be capable of deliver, um, the driver would arrange uh, as interrupts. Now, this results in a performance benefit for IO demanding applications. Now, as far as LSI goes, it increases the merges as uh, IOs and IOPS increase, and no merges were, are used in with fewer IOs or low throughput. Now, this would result in efficient IOs at large throughput and low latency IOs when the throughput is not as high. So um, for, once again, application demanding uh, high IOs and performance with uh, low in with throughput, uh, the pair virtual based on the description would uh, be the most suitable. Now, in addition to that, um, there's uh, something else that could set the two apart. Now, uh, the queue depth limitations, that is. So um, the per virtual, uh, and once again, in comparison to the LSI, um, would uh, actually provide uh, a default adapter queue depth of uh, 245, uh, when the LSI would uh, provide a default adapter queue depth of 128. Now, the maximum adapter queue depth of the pair virtual would be 1024, and once again, the LSI would be 128, which uh, makes a considerable difference just by judging uh, the figures. Now, the, the default virtual disk queue depth of the pair virtual would equal to 64, when the uh, default virtual disk queue depth of the LSI would equal to 32. Now, the maximum virtual disk queue depth of the pair of virtual would be 256, and the maximum virtual disk queue of the LSI would be 32. Now, another um, virtual SCSI controller, which we also took into account, as I previously mentioned, was the NVMe controller. Now, it was designed to reduce uh, software overhead by 50% when compared to uh, HCI SATA SCSI devices. Now, the, the reduced guest I.O. processing overhead with uh, virtual NVMe devices uh, by connecting them together directly to the PCI bus on the server or workstation, which leads to more transactions per minute by eliminating an additional source of latency in the path to the storage, which essentially slow down the VM performance. Whoops, okay. Now, the current comparison, uh, this is actually the benchmarks. Um, let me just sorry, uh, switch back and uh, specify the criteria which we used for the benchmarks. So, um, the benchmarks were actually done with the disk speed uh, previously, and uh, not something that I think would be worth taking a look into the process since now would be quite time consuming and impossible for us to save some time by processing all the benchmarks at the same time, and um, we actually, for comparison purposes, um, selected the differentiation points um, worth considering, uh, taking into account the IOPS, latency, CPU utilization, and uh, specified the patterns in 4K blocks, read-write performance, eight threads, 64 outstanding IO operations, uh, disabled software cache, uh, I ran the benchmark for a duration of 10 seconds um, in the form of a 10 gigabyte test file. So without further ado, um, let's just go ahead and jump into the benchmarks. So the current comparison would show that the um, per virtual SCSI controller can shovel out a higher amount of read IOPS. 
I wouldn't compare it with uh, two of the highest performing controllers, the uh, Pair Virtual SCSI and NVMe. It becomes clear that NVMe shows a higher Q depth uh, when equal to 32 right IOPS performance. And uh, OSI, in the current IOPS comparison, stood out as a universal controller, uh, providing average IOPS for all the workloads. Now, as far as the CPU utilization goes, uh, NVMe has demonstrated the highest read CPU utilization and not the best IOPS performance for the amount of its utilization. It did, in fact, show the lowest utilization and highest write IOPS performance. So, uh, when it comes to the paravirtual uh, SCSI, uh, it's demonstrated the lowest CPU utilization for workloads with a Q depth equal to 254 and the highest for workloads with a Q-depth equal to 32. Now, OSI demonstrated itself as an all-well-rounder as far as IOPS and the utilization goes for that particular pattern, that is. Now, as far as latency goes, um, per virtual SCSI has shown uh, the lowest read latency for the highest IOPS performance for any type of workload. While the uh, per virtual SCSI and NVMe show a near identical write latency, and the per virtual SCSI and NVMe controllers also demonstrate the highest latency for the lowest IOPS performance uh, with the high Q depth workloads. So, uh, OSI has demonstrated the highest latency for the average IOPS performance. And now, um, just as a specification based on theory, um, due to the para virtual SCSI and LSI logic controllers being essentially the same when it comes to overall performance capability, uh, para virtual SCSI has actually, in fact, become still more efficient in the number of host uh, compute cycles that uh, would be required to process the same number of IOPS, uh, which makes it more efficient in that case. And, means that if you have a very storage I.O. intensive virtual machine, this is actually the controller to choose and uh, to ensure you save as many CPU cycles as possible that can be used by the application or host. Now, as far as CPU utilization difference between the OSI and prior virtual SCSI at hundreds of IOPS is somewhat that we would consider insignificant, but at massive I amounts of IOs where they equal to from 10 to 50k um, are streamed over the virtual SCSI bus, the para virtual SCSI can save a large number of uh, CPU cycles. Now, the difference between the OSI and the para virtual controllers um, at very low IOPS is not measurable, but with larger number of IOPS, once again, the para virtual would take the lead. And to summarize, um, that our benchmarks have actually proven which uh, one of the two um, virtual SCSI controllers uh, is the best option for the most common virtualization workload. And hope that you selected the um, SCSI controller of your preference for the workload in particular. And if not, um, I would uh, like to suggest you to actually take uh, your time in specifying and benchmarking each virtual SCSI controller and uh, workload alike. And uh, that actually brings us to the end of uh, today's webinar. And uh, I'd just like to uh, say thank you for uh, your attention and uh, offer you a chance to ask any questions you may have in regards to uh, today's topic. Okay, so we actually received the first question for the time being. Um, let me just, okay, now Steve uh, asked, uh, how does the Windows equivalent storage spaces in brackets of uh, the paravirtual SCSI compare? So um, I believe that uh, it would, be, would depend on the configuration and uh, uh, the configuration of the RAID in particular. So. Uh, if it's done uh, over a configured RAID um, without taking a VME to account, uh, I believe storage spaces does provide a somewhat of a uh, 
performance floating points, uh, which uh, I would consider um, not as stable as a hardware RAID would, for example. Um, and in order to completely answer your question, I believe that uh, it would be quite a good topic uh, to do the next webinar on, and I'll take that into consideration and um, try and uh, host the next webinar based on that topic and provide you with some additional insights. So, um, to take uh, all your interest into account, I uh, just wanted to address this opportunity and possibly receive some of your feedback as to any other topics uh, uh, you would like us to cover in our webinars, uh, just to assist you in uh, a uh, troubleshooting process or you know, making a right decision uh, without uh, having uh, to go through the whole hassle. Yeah, uh, it would absolutely be possible, as Robert uh, addressed the question of uh, perhaps sending us emails of uh, the topics you, you would like to see on our future webinars, and uh, that would be a yes, that would be completely possible. And if you were to send an email reply uh, to the invitation you've previously received to this webinar in particular, uh, it would be possible for us to take them into account and uh, be my pleasure to actually uh, conduct uh, future webinars based on your interests. Okay, so once again, um, I hope that I've answered uh, or had a chance to answer all of your questions. And uh, thank you all for attending today's webinar, uh, for your attention. And uh, it was a pleasure.